I'd like to tell you a little bit about Anchor. If you haven't heard of Anchor, it's a free platform that makes it easy to create a podcast by giving you tools that allow you to record and edit your show right from your phone or computer. Anchor also makes it easy to host and distribute your podcast on all the big listening platforms like Spotify, Apple, and more. It's everything you need to create, host, and distribute a podcast all in one place. And best of all, it's totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. They were the first boy band, not taken seriously. But somehow they became great, mysteriously. They were the podcast, the only one that tells you the truth. About classic era monkeys, and the boldest board of you. They fought for creative, did what they liked to do. But after headquarters, they stuck the writers back to We discovered the PD, and people say we're stingy with stars. But we're too busy being objective to put anybody down. Yeah, welcome to Discograffiti, the music podcast that delivers the objective truth about the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever existed. I almost couldn't get that out in one breath. First things first, you need to know just how seriously we take all this stuff. Discograffiti is heavily researched, and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. And we don't just cover albums. Uh Uh-uh. We do a very, very deep-dived analysis of all EP singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work and bootlegs, and other appearances on artists' records. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between 0 and 5. And that allows us all to come face-to-face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. In this episode of Discograffiti, we are very excited to be turning the spray cans on The Monkees. The world's first boy band turned serious purveyors of psych and country rock innovation. And now, before we continue, we have a very, very special human being in the studio of your mind with us. He is a Grammy-nominated producer and engineer, and since 1990 has compiled the Monkees reissues and worked with such artists as the Kinks, Bee Gees, the band, Elvis Costello, Van Morrison, and the Everly Brothers, and on top of it all, uh, over the course of the last 10 years, has acted in a managerial capacity for the band itself, the Monkees. Let's please give a warm, cozy welcome to the man who helped hoist tonight's band to crazily great heights in the autumn of their years, lads and ladies of Discography City, Andrew Sandoval. Hey there. Welcome, Andrew. Or shall I say, hey, hey. Hey, hey. By the way, you are much more snazzily dressed than we are tonight. I feel like a homeless that's what, person. That's what the, uh, the the listeners are expecting of me. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm dressed for podcasting. <laughs> that's right. Me too. It's a notch below being dressed for radio. So this is, uh, spoiler alert, this is a band that has meant quite a lot to me for a long period of time. So, um, you know, I've always loved them. I saw them live in 86. Um, used to watch the show all the time. But mainly when I found head as a, a very young person like t- uh, i was maybe 12 uh it totally blew my mind uh joe did you was this That's, a i had almost the identical uh experience because yeah. i kind of got into them as probably a lot of people our age did um uh when mtv aired the show in the mm-hmm. 80s the 86 right yeah um, so i was maybe I, 13 14 was it? um and um uh, my mom was a huge fan when she was a teenager my mom's born in 51 so she was kind of like right prime age to be a first wave monkeys fan um so we had all the records in the house we had all the all her original records were still hanging around all the first like probably four or five of them so and then i kind of drifted away from them but then in college um same thing i saw head and, um, you know, was kind of getting into like the Beach Boys and the Wrecking Crew and all that music at that time. Um, so they were always a natural for me. I, you know, it, it's right in my right in my wheelhouse. Yeah. 
Especially Beach Boys being a very apt comparison, America's band, and then underneath there's all this completely wacky crap going on. And a lot of the same people, yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of the same musicians, you know, I'm not songwriters so much, but a lot of the same, you know, Wrecking Crew people and you know, that, that same golden era of, of rock is, you know, I, I, I was drawn to that stuff always. So. so what about, Andrew, what about you? So when you're a kid, are you thinking, I, when I grow up, I want to be the most important guy uh, in the monkeys camp? Uh, I thought I was going to work with the Beatles. <laughs> I, I honestly, uh, that was my big dream. But um, I, I grew up loving the monkeys and i discovered them when i was about five i was watching um uh, channel 11 here in los angeles this is where i grew up this is my hometown i still live here and um started seeing music i loved the beatles already and i started seeing and hearing music uh on television that was reminiscent of the beatles and i begged my parents to get me some monkeys records to go with the beatles records that i already had in my collection because they were huge beatles fans my my parents and uh, one day they opened up their record cabinet to me and bestowed me all these Beatles records. They were thrilled that I loved the Beatles. And they, but their tastes ran from the Beatles to sort of the Eagles and Chicago and Quicksilver Messenger Service. Like that was the stuff they had in their record cabinet. They didn't have any monkeys or Jerry and the Pacemakers or things that I would come to love in my life. Um, that was my rebellion. But uh, my father went out in uh, 1977 or so to a record store to try and buy a monkey's record unbeknownst to me they only had one record in print at that time which was the heirs to greatest hits we didn't know from imprint out of print whatever there was nothing at this record store but he saw a guy try and trade in the monkey's records and he was turned away the the gentleman with the records it was a secondhand store and so my father followed him out bought the records and like you i had the first four or five uh, monkeys records in my life for those early days and then got deeper into them as the 80s progressed um, certainly the MTV thing brought forth a lot of people who were interested in the monkeys and a lot of knowledge about the monkeys so I started reading everything and it's studied. a good TV show if you watch it it's, it's <laughs> actually it, it was it, at least it's, it was in the 80s it was really good like, it, it's I, still uh, it's still good I feel like I knew like every one you know like I, I had kind of like I knew what happened in every episode by the time because it was on for like a solid year or something. They played it yeah. constantly. Yeah, it was on three times a day at one point on MTV in '86. And mm -hmm. uh, six years ago, I worked on the restoration of all of the television episodes from the original 35 millimeters. So I got to watch them again in their truest form. And the Blu-ray set that Rhino put out six years ago is really beautiful. If you mm -hmm. forget to see, it has head, which I worked on a Criterion edition of that uh, with Bob Rafelson and. Uh, so I've been down down the road of all the films as well as the music, but um, the music is actually what I have the strongest bond with of all things in the world of the monkeys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say I appreciated a lot of the deep cuts over the years, but then for this show, going and re-listening to everything, I feel like I unearthed a lot more. That I, I realized I hadn't really delved all the way into all the records. I knew like mo all the hits, obviously, and then the, the, the good selection of the kind of so deeper much, cuts. There's so much good material. Yeah, the, I think I was a little surprised by the consistency of their best stuff, like how kind of how packed those records are with good two, material. Two, I think, notions that really hang over the monkeys uh, as an act is the the intense amount of great material, but also conceptually, there is so much to endlessly ruminate about about these guys because this is basically you know uh, a, a a show about a band that that then became an actual band and the likelihood of that happening is uh you know infinitesimal enough but then you add the fact that they became a great band is insane and completely unlikely but to start the whole thing off our story begins in 1962 um, as Bob Rafelson, who at that time was an aspiring filmmaker, not uh, the great filmmaker that he became, uh, be got the initial idea for The Monkees, uh, the TV show, but was uh, unsuccessful in actually getting it off the ground. So this is pre-Beatles. Yeah. Right. I mean, to give you a little background on, on Bob, because um, I did a lot of recent research on Bob and even interviewed him again during lockdown. We talked and did a new interview in 2020. Um, about his earliest days pre-Monkeys. And he was an unsuccessful television producer, really. I mean, he started out in radio and writing, and he's an incredibly clever man. And he was a real film buff and wanted to move into motion pictures. But 
he was also a very feisty, uncompromising guy who ended up in big fights turning over desks with lots of people. Or if he didn't, he told you that he turned over their desks <laughs> and pushed them down a flight of stairs. Right. You know, I mean, he's one of those kinds of characters that, uh, you know, uh, that would do that. And then Bert Schneider, uh, he, you know, who he came to meet, um, whose father was running Columbia Pictures at the time, he too was somewhat unsatisfied with what was going on in his life. He didn't want to just be the the son, you know, getting a, a leg up from his dad. I mean, he was the assistant to people, and he would come up with different marketing ideas. But he was a incredibly clever, clever man. I mean, he just brilliant in, in how he shaped things. And without so, those so two they're, guys... So they're kicking around for, you know, for however long they are. They meet in 64. Right. Right. They form Ray Burt Productions. Right. They may have met slightly earlier, but at least by then they were, they well, formed. Okay, yeah. So they, they met, or it was May 64, they teamed up. Then. Right. And yeah. the Ray Burt is, is really formed actually though in 65. Um, and and they, the the first thing they're doing is not necessarily the monkeys. Just that's the other thing. People think, oh, well, they got right off onto the monkeys. They were optioning books. They were they were trying to do all kinds of different things. The monkeys thing just kind of took shape quickly, and when it took off, it became so successful so quickly once it was sold that they didn't have time to do all the other projects they thought they were going to do at the outset. I wonder yeah. what they were thinking when they were watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. They were just must have been like, "Yes, well, yeah, this is it." Yeah, well, so after Hard Day's Night and Help, then they started repitching it. Yeah. They revived the idea. You're like, hey, I have this idea from. Uh, Do you happen to see the thing in the uh, as you were re- as I was researching this that Davy was at the taping of? He was on the Ed Sullivan. He was show. on the Ed Sullivan show with the, the same day, the with, same night with the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. I did not know. Now that. he was That's in. Cool. He was doing a scene from Oliver, which he was in. Yeah, he was the Artful Dodge. My dad was in the cast of Oliver at that time with Davy Jones. Oh wow! Yep, oh, fantastic cool. in New York City. Yep. He was in the uh, wow. the uh, Broadway. I guess they had done it first in the West End in London. This was the New York cast. Yeah, they. My dad was in the touring production of it too. Davy did a short stint in the touring production of it before uh, coming out to California. He was in also a, a show called Pickwick uh-huh. here in Los Angeles prior to getting into the Monkees. But they built the Monkees around him. Around Davy, yeah. Um, but because he was already signed to. Uh, yes, to he won a Jones. Tony for uh, for yeah, Oliver. Yeah. It, I, yeah, I think it was it was Tony nominated. Tony nominated, okay. Tony nominated. Right. Still, but, uh, still. Pretty, but yeah, he good. the the criticism of the monkeys, which we're going to get into lots of criticisms yeah, yeah. of the monkeys, was that the monkeys did not pay their dues. This and I I did a lot of background um, looking into what, what was the big beef that people had with the monkeys. Monkeys did not pay their dues, and when you look back at all four of them, all four of them had a large large experience on stage Mm -hmm. all of them were musical all of them had done recording Mm -hmm. you know all of them had paid their dues they just didn't pay their dues together well there's an irony to it that they (laughs) were the you know they were made in the image of the beatles but it was the beatles who really changed the rules where it made it like you had to write your own songs and play your own instruments it was kind of like the right the brill building wrecking crew system before that nobody really had a problem with any of it and look when at the Beatles. Look, and, and so look it's kind of like, uh, I, it's an irony, really. Look that at introducing uh, the Beatles. It's stuffed with Backrack and David and, right, you know, uh, right. Barry Gordy. Um, but just to just to get us up to when, you know, the monkeys are actually making records. Um, cor- correct me if I take a misstep here, but uh, the show was sold to Screen Gems in April 65 with Dave, uh, with... Uh, no, actually, no? I'll, 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 uh, I'll do a real fast version of it, which is that... The Raybert was launched in April of '65. They got a pilot script done by Paul Mazursky and Larry Tucker about a month or two later. They started auditioning uh, so for people. So funny all the greats, all the future greats of cinema worked on this. Yeah. So in September of '65, they ran ads in Hollywood Reporter and Variety. That's where they found madness auditions, folk and roll musicians, singers for acting roles in new TV series, running parts for four insane boys <laughs> aged 17 to 21. Right, and there's the cops coming to get us right now. Right. We're talking about that. So, and then in October, um, they had at, made their final choices of the four monkeys: Michael Nesmith, Peter Tork, David Jones, and Mickey Dolenz. They went to nailed Sandy- it. So right. They went to San Diego. They filmed a pilot, uh, and that was also in San Diego. The first time the monkeys ever played together as a mm-hmm. group. They were on a set that had actual amps and they had guitars, and they said, "Why don't we try this?" and 
that really sparked something in all four of them. Uh, if they never met again, they would have had that moment where the four of them played into my new book. Uh, there's a picture of them from that moment where they're actually playing together. Davey's at the front smoking a cigarette, and they're just jamming on, you know, a, probably a, a 12 bar or something like that. Yeah. But it's it's cool that they had that that thing, even though they're just a scripted band. So fast forward to the beginning of 66. One other cool thing that we, because yeah. I know it's, it's not to do with the monkeys, but I, in doing my research, I had no idea that uh, th- that the Love and Spoonful was actually the first choice. That was the first choice, but they didn't want to be on a television show, right? You know, and and they were probably smart in that they understood that that was the credibility was not going to be there with. Ten with years it. later, Welcome Back, Cotter falls in Sebastian's <laughs> lap. I don't hear him crying today. <laughs> um, it seemed like it couldn't have possibly been as good because I, I imagine one of the reasons <clears throat> that the four monkeys were selected is they could also act a little bit, right? And they had charisma in that yeah. way. It's a whole different. I think Zalyanovsky would have pulled it off. Maybe yeah. maybe not the other guys. But. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Zal would have been great on yeah. any any kind of show if you could control him. I mean, that right. that's the thing. Um, he was probably more out of control than the monkeys. But yeah. but they're you good, s- they're good uh, comic actors. Yeah. So. But if you see the combinations in the in the camera tests and, and stuff that have shown up on the Criterion version of Head as well as the Blu-ray box, you see the different actors that they were considering, and you see them, and you just know well. Those aren't the monkeys. These right, are, these right. are the monkeys. So in February '66, they sold the show to NBC, and in May of '66, they started not only making records but also getting ready and, and starting to make television episodes. Right. And then August '66, um, Last Train to Clarksville comes out, backed with uh, Take a Giant Step. Right. Um, so that is a few weeks. Uh, before the, uh, the the debut of the television show, um, which airs September 12th, 1966. Right. And what's so remarkable about the first Monkees album and first singles, you know, you, you have August 66 is when Clarksville comes out with Take a Giant Step. It had only been recorded on July 25th. Mm-hmm. The entire first Monkees album was recorded in the month of July, really. They had a sort of a carryover one song, maybe that was done in June, but May through early July was a period of confusion for Don Kirshner, who had taken on this project. He was the head of music for Screen Gems Television and also a publisher who had in his stable Goffin and King, Man and Whale, um, and David this is, Gates, and this Boys is and a Heart. very interesting figure in Monkey's mythology because he is, uh, certainly if you are a big fan of the band, he is painted in very stark terms as the villain of the piece. Yes, and um, in actuality, it's certainly not quite, not that, not nearly that simple. Anybody who told the monkeys what to do is a villain, right? Right. As, <laughs> as I learned myself, but but Kirshner, if you want to look at this first album, which is as I say, all kind of thrown together in a month, mm-hmm. and it does have a little bit of a thrown together quality. Side B mostly. It's. It's a strong, strong record, mm-hmm. uh, and that's why did I rate it a four? Wait, hold on, we're getting well, ahead. Before, <laughs> Dave, are we getting into a phase? We are. I think there's a phase so, starting. Phase one, prefab, 1965 to 1967. So in October 1966, the debut record comes out, The Monkees. Uh, it was the first of four consecutive U.S. number one albums for the group. It was number one for 13 weeks, um, after which it was. Uh, replaced by their second album. Now, that's ballin'. Um, it also topped the UK charts in 67. Um, it's uh, sold 5 million copies to date. Is that right? Even About more, that? probably, yeah. 5 million and change. At least 5, five million and one. Five million. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, this is, uh, n- there's not a single track on the original LP that actually has all four monkeys on it. Is that correct? Or? Um, yeah. Uh, the um, the first monkey to play on a monkey's record is Peter Torque. He's playing guitar. One of many guitarists on Papa Jean's Blues and Sweet Young Thing. He's on the two Michael Nesmith productions that are on the awesome record. Awesome songs. And the big misnomer that a lot of people have is the Wrecking Crew do the monkey's records. In actuality, especially this first album, which is mostly Boyce and Hart mm-hmm. cuts, it's the Boyce and Hart band. Right, the Candy Store Prophets. Right. Yeah. Who are a big part of, I think, why this record's kind of successful and that, how they were able to do it quickly, because they were an actual functioning band. 
and they kind of wrote a lot of the tunes. So they like the if you listen to the performance of Last Train to Clarksville, that's a really excellent band playing. Mm-hmm. Like they they really they 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 really are swinging on that real quite nicely. And Don Kirshner so did not want to have Boyce and Hart and their band doing this record. This these were the last option for him. Uh, he wanted Phil Spector to produce the Monkees. Right, right. Phil Spector didn't want to do it. He wanted Mickey Most to do it. Mickey Most took him seriously, but said, I'm not moving out to California to deal with this. And then he got Snuff Garrett involved for one session, and Snuff Garrett quit after one day. <laughs> and Snuff Garrett at the time was huge doing the Gary Lewis and the Playboys records, which right. were, I mean, Gary Lewis was coming off of, I think, like six top ten records. So Snuff was a natural choice, perfect for the kind of sound that that Kirshner envisioned for the Monkees. You know, he, he thought that Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart were maybe B-list, C-list players. They had written a couple of hits. And the way they finally got this was he ran out of options, and then they invited him to a rehearsal studio, and they had their band play the songs for him live so that he could get a feel. And he's like, okay, fine. You know, but yeah. there's a, it seems like there's some of these songs have a little bit more like kind of hips to them than the standard like Wrecking Crew session because these guys were a real band. Right. Like they, it has a kind of almost like I wouldn't I wouldn't maybe go all the way to as, as far as to say like a Nuggets kind of sound, but it's a little bit more kind of like not the fact that it's not so ultra professional. It's more like a real rock band. And, yeah. You know, I, 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 it's probably what like maybe seven or eight of the songs. They're the, they're kind of the main band. Yes, they are. Yeah. Um, and it's it is a different feel than what you would get on a Gary Lewis record or even a Beach Boys record yeah. uh, from the period because there is a there is a little less polish even though it's sort of this, you know, contrived But, but still thing. great feel, though. Still oh, really totally. Still great feel, you know, like... Uh, much like, much better feel in some yeah. respects. Yeah. There's a very cohered feeling to it, uh, especially keeping in mind the, the knockabout way that the whole thing came together. Uh, it really... And also, it's also not even in... You know, in a sort of specific way, supposed to even be taken as a record. It's supposed to be the soundtrack to the TV show in a certain way. Right, right, right exactly. So no one knew that it was going to sell the way it did, except for Don Kirshner. He, right. he had yeah. an inkling that this was going to really work out, though he had nothing to base that on because he had run Cole Picks Records, which was a huge money loser, he lost millions of dollars when a million dollars was really a lot of money mm-hmm. in the 60s. And you know, his other stuff that he had done with Dimension and, and whatnot, great records, but nothing like uh, an album. And he wanted to make an album that was like the Beatles. He was going to beat the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And he did. Yeah, he did. He did. <laughs> so some standout tracks in this one, Sat- Saturday's Child. Saturday's Child Love is that. unbelievable. Uh, written by David Gates of Bread fame. Um, yeah, uh, Saturday's Child, uh, garage pop with a riff that... I, I swear to God, is maybe a touch responsible for the eventual birth of metal, <laughs> which is weird to say, but it definitely has that. Um, you know, do, did you feel that way when you heard it? You're a metal. No, guy. I, my reaction was that it was it had that kind of nuggetsy kind of stomp. Yeah, to it. And yeah, it is, and it is yeah. the Candy Store Prophets on that as well. It's the voice and heart bands. Um, love the way they play on that. My, uh, so the first side of the record is really uh, it, it really blows you away. You got the uh, theme for the monkeys. Saturday's Child, I Want to Be Free, which is probably my favorite Davy Jones song. Papa Jean's Blues, a great Nesmith song. Take a Giant Step. Um, that's all just the first side. And then it, it, side B starts off with Last Train to Clarksville. The second side, uh, in my opinion, a little bit uh, sort of like we'll put the filler on. Um, a few of the songs, like Let's Dance On, I'll Be True to You, a couple other ones, not quite of the same caliber. There's I would call pot boilers. You know, right. It's like we're going like, to gonna whip one up kind of quick and get it, get it going. You know, like, um, still, still cool. You know? Yeah, um, yeah. Th- this, this, this run, I was really surprised at how good it was throughout. Um, I, and a lot of these were new to me. Um, I love the, uh, the guitar playing on Papa Jean's Blues. That, that is the awesome. great lead, James yeah. Burton. Yeah, the great lead stuff is mostly James Burton. Great yeah. ace guitar player. Super cool. I'd have um, to say my favorite is Take a Giant Step as far as a favorite from it's the It's kind of like a Wasn't Born to Follow, kind yeah, of yeah. like in that kind of vein. Yeah. and But a predecessor to it, you know, or, right. or earlier song, right. and but by the same same writers who would, who would give you that in about eight months or something like that. Right. Um, the interesting thing about these early records, the first two albums, Don Kirshner not only credited as the music supervisor, but he is actually the guy who sequenced and, and selected these songs because he, there were other songs. He could mm-hmm. have put on other songs on those first two albums, and that that makes your mind boggle 
what other great songs he had that he left off, especially when we get into the next one. But in general, yeah. their first whatever four or five years, the amount of stuff they did is really like it's crazy. You yeah. have to almost kind of look at the albums in that light as they're making what, like two of them a year or something. Right. They made it. They're making them right one right after. I mean, I guess they're kind of just always making tunes, and then they they recorded know. about four hundred songs in the space of five years. Yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah, I mean, not necessarily finished productions, right? But um, yeah. You can kind of get the that you can hear the country rock Nesmith's imprint on this already. There's more of that stuff in their records that I kind of realize. I think because I think the songs that are like, a lot of Nesmith songs are the buried gems because they weren't singles, right? But they a lot of times are like really super high quality songs on the record. There's those were a lot of the discoveries for me. And this he's, time, this he's burying that. There's a lot of those. He's of good burying the, that kind of music in in here way earlier than Sweetheart of the Rodeo yeah, or agreed. You know these other uh, even Bradley's Barn, all these other quintessential uh, country rock things. Sure, you. But you have to say like Rick Nelson, Ricky Nelson, Hello Mary Lou is not a far cousin from Papa Jean's Blues. Right. Same guy, James Burton playing the guitar, and Don Peake, who's the arranger on those Nesmith early Nesmith sessions, you know, he was a guy working with everybody uh, in, in the Wrecking Crew uh, mm-hmm. sort of period. So so I give Nesmith a lot of credit for introducing uh, country folk and even a Latin flavor mm-hmm. to a lot of stuff. But by the same token, Rick Nelson kind of beats everybody right. to, to, the, to the game. And he's mm-hmm. on television doing those songs too right. and loved country music. So... Right. Um, He's he's the godfather of country rock before right. Graham and you know one of the the interesting thing and this is where the conceptual uh, there uh, when I think about the monkeys the thoughts can go on forever because uh, just stepping out of the gate for these guys there's that notion of authenticity which today nobody gives a fuck about that but back then it was everything if there was a whiff of inauthenticity. You were laid bare as a gag, basically. Yeah, I think that that is a generational thing. Yeah, and I think that the people um, caught up in that at the time, um, it, it was almost a, a lack of maturity that they had. That they felt that that they were so angry about the monkeys, not so much for their illegitimacy, but for the fact that the monkeys took up space on the airwaves that could have been used for other things. Right. I, I would talk to a lot of people from that era, and I have, and. They would get so riled up with the mention of the monkeys. These guys aren't a real band like the Vanilla Fudge, right? Well, right. it was just it was like, well, what? What's the? What did they? You don't understand, and it's like, no, I do understand. You guys had the most amazing soul music. You had some of the most amazing country music. You had incredible folk music. You had all of this great stuff. But you're really angry that the monkeys existed in this time period too. What it's, it's, a, it's a yeah. it's a kind of a reductive argument like that's made like that's that's a, it's kind of a crude argument. They didn't even play their own instruments, you know. And it's like about like Elvis. No, like but Elvis back, but good. back then, it, not only did it matter. I to think it's persisted else. even beyond. I think it became like part of just like what people that was like their default reaction. It's but an the, urban but urban myth. But yeah. then the slapback was the 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 next. Ra- so let's do ratings on. Okay, this we'll one. move so on I, to the next one. I give I give this uh, four stars. Also four stars for me. It got, got four stars from me. All right, all right. See, this, this is, is an objective show. Yeah, not quite. This is, this not is scientific quite a, fact. Yeah, not quite a perfect album from the monkeys. No, but no. they would get there. But so. the, yeah, but the but first four side is, is four is very good. It's four a very solid. Great, record. Yeah. 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 But then when we move on, okay, so January 1967, more of the monkeys comes mm-hmm. out. There's the the only word I can use to describe uh, this record is divisive, mainly from within the band. Um, you know this notion of auth- inauthenticity. Uh, especially with with Mike Nesmith, from all accounts, this was something that really riled him up, and the rest of the band. I'm assuming not as much Davy Jones, just from his theatrical uh, instincts early on. He probably wasn't. Do you, do you know? Was this something that that weighed on on Davy Jones at the time? Yeah, it, it did actually it because. Did? In doing this new research I did, I discovered these court documents and these depositions from May of 67 where they went over the first two albums song by song with the Monkees. Mm -hmm. And Davey said, you know, I wasn't as upset about more of the Monkees as the other guys, but how am I going to explain to my children someday when they say, Dad, what what is uh, uh, the day we fall in love? What is this? And he's like, I got to admit that that's not very good, you know. And I mean, he's the person obviously having to do it. So... 
he, Davy had taste. All four of them had divergent taste, and that was really the problem with them. Yeah, yeah. So apparently, this record was released, and they just like weren't even told it was coming they out. Right. They just saw right. it in the store. Well, so, yes and no. Right. The reality is, the they knew about thing. it, mm-hmm. but they were unhappy that they didn't have artistic approval over any of it, mm-hmm. from the the cover, which is them dressed in J.C. Penney's clothing, right. which is a tie-in. If they rushed out the record, they would sell the record in the clothes store or the department store, rather. And that led to their biggest selling record of all time. Right. I mean, it was a brilliant marketing move. And the fact that you could... It was could, number one for 18 weeks. Right? You could buy the clothes they were wearing on the cover at the same place you bought the the album at. Right. Never again in recorded music history could you do that. <laughs> it but was the, the uh, top selling record of 1967. Was yes. it really? Yeah, you believe that? That's it, unreal. Wow. It defeated a little record called Sgt. Wow. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a huge record, but they... It sort of started leaking out around December 66. They were on a concert tour. Ship dates, street dates, then wasn't a big deal. People were mm-hmm. like, how come you don't have the exact release date of this Monkey's Records? It didn't work that way in the right. 60s. In England and some other places, they have those exact dates. But in America, they were like, we got to satisfy the demand. As soon as we can get some of these records out in the stores, st- stick them out in the bins, start selling them. We, we, they were not precious about this record. Mm-hmm. And it made the monkeys very upset because the monkeys were on tour as a real group by December of '66, and they were also incredibly popular by this time and had a voice. Yeah, thing and, is, and and it's, and, it's a good uh, record. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, it's the beyond that. That's the crazy th- to me. Anyway, I mean, this is uh, better than the first record, number one, I think. Um, and uh, you know, interestingly, these guys find out about it in Cleveland, right? They're on tour. Actually, even sooner, I found okay. I found out, but yeah. And so uh, Nesmith, soon after that, told uh, Melody Maker magazine, uh, and I quote, that More of the Monkeys was probably the worst album in the history of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and so now they're, you know, these, these guys are getting, you know, very concerned that they're being misrepresented. Um, and uh, I know Nesmith uh, lobbied... Uh, against uh, Bob and Bert to be allowed to play their instruments on the records uh, after this. And this was the linchpin that allowed them to, to eventually have artistic control. But the odd part of it to me is that it is like pop perfection. It's, it's, it's to me, uh, very, very close to being uh, a, a masterpiece on its own. And, you know, um, there's there's, I think... Hold on, girl, and laugh are the only two that I think are not like top tier pop material. Yeah, I, I would disagree with you. Um, although I like the album, my biggest concern with the record, and it's all hindsight, is that Kirshner had so many other good songs to put on this record, and he, I think, he made some bad choices. And I also think he was boxed in to have to put on stuff like laugh because he owed. Mm-hmm. The Tokens a favor, who I love the Tokens. I mean, I could do a whole show with you on the Tokens. But I mean, he... Do you want to interpolate it here in between? <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot more albums than you would imagine. Yes. <laughs> but um, And they have a psychedelic masterpiece. I already know because I heard it a couple days ago. Yeah, yes, uh, they do. And, but, but let's stay on the monkeys. Yeah. And that is, <laughs> there were songs like I'll Be Back Upon My Feet, uh, You Just May Be The One, the TV version yeah. of that. I mean, mm, so Kirshner had 30 plus songs to choose from. And he chose these, what, 11 or 12? And I, I don't think he made the best choices. This one seems not quite as good to me as the first one. Really? I, think, I would say this one's a slight notch below the first one. Um, there, is t- there are two iconic... Uh, you guys are nuts. There's the two iconic singles, I'm a Believer and Not Your Stepping Stone. Uh, you know. But there's also She and Mary She's Mary. the great opener. That's another Candy Prophet's really banger song. Um, super cool. Um, Mary Mary is great. Mary with the, is great. That is the Wrecking Crew. I mean, you yeah. know, that, that's how playing on drums. Right. Uh, talk about lasting power. So that one was re- uh, recorded... Um, by the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. That's a great version. Prior to the Monkeys, yeah. The, yeah. the gem that's buried in it is this, to me, was uh, Sometime in the Morning. That one. That is that the one, best song that on the record, a really great, I think. Great little uh, I think it's a better song than me. I'm a Believer, even. I, I love Sometime I mean, I'm a Believer is so good, it's stupid. It's I know, just, it's it is. It's crazy good. Yeah, it it's is. It's really such it's, a great single. It's a masterpiece. There, you know, listen, I listen to all these kind of in headphones for this, you know, to kind of give it a good close listen. It, it, Pretty much for every episode of the show, but there it's even things I didn't notice, and I'm a believer. The great little skipping bass line in it, and it's, yeah, it's such a great arrangement and song. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, Andy Griselda's great. Um, 
the the kind of girl I can love. Uh, Andy Griselda to me is kind of like a Ringo song. It's like a song yeah. you could picture Ringo singing it. You know, yeah. it's kind of like in that kind of. Voice. It earns its place. Ringo via the Ruddles. Right. Yeah. <laughs> This one to me is a step up. I would give this record four and a half stars. Actually, I gave it three and a half. I th- what did I say? You said four. I say four. I, you can back. It's down. very. I, it's I very say, close. I'd back it down to maybe three and a half. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, you know, I thought it was uh, uh, interesting to the one that that didn't get put on this record that I think was a, a misstep was "I'll Spend My Life with You." It's one of my. Right. Favorite Dol- Overlook Dolan's tunes. Yeah, and, and my star rating on this is only because the ones that are five stars are so good yeah. that I think the monkeys go way beyond expectations. It mm-hmm. is, again, this is a second volume of a soundtrack to a TV show. The monkeys threw all of that away. They were going to start making albums. They were going to be a real group. Yeah, I kind of approach my ratings the same way. I'm kind of like comparing them to each other. So I have the ones that are the top ones are kind of like the yeah. vibes. And that's kind of so like am I, and I love it, and yeah. I give it four you, and you a half strong, stars. You have strong feelings passion. about this one. I, I, I love I'm, this I'm here for it. I'm here for I it. I haven't heard two you, copies of this album. God I haven't heard it. you defend the day we fall in love yet. It was not on your list of <laughs> that one. I, I had that marked as a pass on my list. <laughs> what the the, 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 the day, <laughs> day we fall in love? I love I'm a hard, it. I'm a hard I love it. First of all, Don Randy on harpsichord here, friend of the pod. Uh, and there's a kind of whole subgenre of Davy is dreamy kind of songs. Yeah. And there's there's a few of these. Uh, it seems like you know they, a lot of times he doesn't get the the uh, he gets sort of the more lightweight material, and um, I, I think that's you know that, that's I, yeah. I love it when he gets the rockers. His songs, I love when he gets the same. His rockers. songs feel like beds for him to lie down in. Some are going to be more comfortable yeah. for him. Some not as much. Yeah, he's always great. I love when they yeah. cast him against type, and he's and he sings the ones yes. that kind of rock. You know, yeah. um, he, he they also it's I, you can see why uh, he, he kind of uses the uh, his British accent as kind of like another color for the record. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it sort of uh, very reminiscent of his first album, um, David Jones on Cold Picks, right. mm-hmm. which is not a great album, but. But has lots of stuff like this. A lot of the Davy is dreamy kind theme of theme from a new love. <laughs> right, it was very right. much like this. Yeah. I, uh, one uh, just for the uh, one for the record books. Um, not as dreamy with a mullet. <laughs> you're getting to a later period. That we, yeah, you're we, just uh, flash uh, forward. That's he's yeah. still dreamy. Yeah. <laughs> not as dreamy. That's all. <laughs> all right. No, so we got a couple singles next. Is that right? So uh, moving right along, we're entering a new phase. Oh, that's right. Phase two. Pop Pinocchio, 1967 to 1968. So Kirshner had begun uh, kind of overstepping his boundaries. Um, Mike Nesmith had uh, had very notoriously punched a wall and said that could have been your face. Um, And basically he uh, just had made one too many decisions on his own um, without consulting people and was given the boot. Uh, their first taste of freedom is one of my absolute favorite monkey songs. Very few people know of it. Uh, it's a January 1967 outtake called All of Your Toys. You can hear the glee. I mean, you can hear these guys are so happy to be making this song. What do you think about All Your Toys? Well, I love it. I, I think The Girl I Knew Somewhere, which is from the same session, is a better song and ultimately you know that becomes the the next B side for them, and that's all the guys ever ever really wanted was uh, was this B side out of Kirshner, and he would not give it to them. I mean, it was a great compromise they came up with in this situation because he was begging them for another single to follow. I'm a believer, and he needed their voices, and he didn't want to release Valerie, which he had in the can, another song that could have been on more of the Monkeys, and that original version of Valerie is so good, maybe better than the later single version, mm. um, but. They said, no, 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 you know, and then they said, yeah, we'll do it. We'll do a new single with you, but just give us the B-side. And, you know, he said, no. I mean, you think, what would it hurt giving these guys the B-side? The other thing is, when they played this concert tour, late 66, early 67, he never showed up to say, hey, I really, you guys are coming along, that was great. You know, the typical Hollywood or, you know, music business thing also, anything also you just the, show up and you just say you guys look like you're having fun up there and they would have been so delighted but he adamantly said I'm not even going to go near one of their concerts what, what about the back cover of More of the Monkeys They're, the band is kind of an they're, rel- they're relegated yeah. to his to his good work right. but <laughs> in in his mind I mean he had created this and he did to a certain extent but he still needed them 
and their power and their popularity continued to grow. So I guess they had some leverage at this point because they're selling a bunch of records and like you know, they yeah. did, and it was it was tough to 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 scrap. You know, they thought about replacing Michael Nesmith. They thought about a lot of the producers thought about a lot of things, but it was tough to scrap where they were. Um, they were threatened. The, you know, they threatened the if monkeys. If you got rid of Nesmith, you'd have to bring Zappa in to play him. <laughs> <laughs> they thought that they could do different things. And Davey was actually the one who wanted to leave the most because he thought he was getting a really raw deal. He was convinced everybody was making more money than he was. Hmm. And uh, and there's paperwork even to show that they went through all the contracts for his, his attorneys. And they said, you know, you're actually making like a $5 more than everybody per week, actually, <laughs> based on your old contract. But he was convinced because he signed. Which was like 525 back then. <laughs> yeah, because he, he signed to Columbia Pictures so early on in 64 that he was he thought he was getting so screwed in 1966 when the thing went through the roof. So uh, in, you know, quantum mechanics and, uh, you know, has it that there is a universe that... that uh, that is in existence where the third monkeys album comes out and they're not rallying against the uh not trying to bite the hand that feeds them what is that third album like what is it is it mostly davy the the second record uh, or the third record rather under kirshner's reign would have been heavily jeff barry mm-hmm. and linzer randell and he actually recorded enough tracks in february of 67 uh for a full third record of his of Kirshner not using any of the more of the monkey songs that he had left over like 15 or more songs. So it's There's interesting, such but not short amounts of time passing between all this. Yeah. And not, not a particularly inspired group of songs and Jeff Barry, not at his best. I, I wouldn't say um, certainly not at the level you heard him on and more of the monkeys where he, he was doing some outstanding stuff for them. Ultimately, the the monkeys won and they they got their own producer Chip Douglas right from and the those turtles. two singles by the way are both great all your toys yeah. a little bit me a little bit well you. all your toys was an outtake right? it's an outtake so yeah. it never came out right. or, until about 1987 that right. I give five stars I know it's just a single song <laughs> right. but right. I give it an absolute to me that's I love that tune uh, March 67 well, a little bit me a little bit you is amazing yeah that's great bit, that's hands bit down me, five stars back with the girl I knew somewhere that's, love that yeah that's that's five stars one of my favorites. That is the point at the tail at which we exunt Donnie. He's at the door. <laughs> exunt. Is that the pronoun- I pronunciation? I don't know. I'm guessing. <laughs> but he went on to, he's like, I can't work with human beings anymore. I have to work with cartoons because they're more malleable. <laughs> yeah. He, well, he had a real problem because it wasn't just his problem with the monkeys. I mean, he had become paranoid and started recording people's phone conversations. So when he was ousted oh. uh, over the monkeys, situation he threatened the people at columbia pictures he, he said i'm suing you but i have recordings of you in conversation and i'm going to reveal them um why don't we talk settlement and they said via their attorneys we think they're going to be a lot more damaging to you produce the evidence we want to hear them and at that point he destroyed the evidence that he had of the phone <laughs> calls and that's why the court case didn't go on the way that most people think it did. And that was the the backstory. But by the end of the 1960s, he had the number one record, Sugar Sugar by the Archies. Which is a masterpiece. So again, yeah. you know, the quote unquote villain of this piece still making great shit out of the monkeys. I mean, there's no there's no clear black and white in this. In he this was story. a brilliant man. He, Don Kirshner's yeah. a brilliant man. And, but the monkeys had a wealth of talent around them. Sure. But yeah. so he is just left in their wake. And now we sail forth into... Uh, you know, very inspired waters. So May 1967, uh, entering into the summer of love, headquarters comes out, uh, released on uh, May 22nd, uh, charting at number one. Uh, unfortunately, replaced the following week, but fortunately, it was by the Beatles. Uh, so, Sergeant Pepper, it's you know an honor to be replaced on the charts there. Um, but it began a run of 11 weeks at number two to Sergeant Pepper's number one. Um, now headquarters, obviously, that they're all playing on this, and the, the the unit is mostly Mickey on drums, Mike on guitar, Peter on keys, and Chip Douglas on bass, and then some switching around within that. Um, Davy on Davy on percussion. Davy on percussion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, now, most I think the Mickey on drums is maybe kind of the one guy who maybe might not have made it as like a professional like sideman musician guy. He's an excellent singer, good drummer. Yeah. Not how he's not Hal Blaine. He's not you know, the other guys, are all pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the but the way that they play the the 
sort of ramshackle charm about yeah, it. Yeah, it's a strength. It fits it's, the it, material they're writing. It's a Everything strength and not fits. a weakness, yes. You know, if they were trying to do Sgt. Pepper, but playing yeah. like this, it wouldn't work. It's very fun to listen to. I love this record yeah, a lot. Yeah, it's great. It's great. You particularly, you have a, a place in your heart for this one, right? I love this record. I think it's um, I think it's their most important record. It's right. not my favorite record by them, but I give this one five stars because five for effort, for sure. Mm-hmm. And I think it just has this real genuine quality. And I can't think of one bad song on this. And they've got goofy things on it, like Band 6 and Zilch and stuff. But all of that is part of the Monkees' personality. And I think Chip Douglas does a brilliant job producing it. Uh, fidelity wise, sometimes I wish it wasn't so, you know, upper mid rangey and boxy, but mm-hmm. but um it, it's a brilliant endeavor, all done sort of in March sixty seven, early April sixty seven, and then out a few weeks later. And um what a great thing. You know? Yeah, this one really reveals Peter to be a strong uh, multi instrumentalist, got really good feel, a good keyboard player, it was good banjo. It's real like he's he becomes a lot bigger of an asset to them on this record. And the bassist on You Just May Be The One, when they recut it, that's the four of them. That's, re- you know, if you want to say what song has all four of them on it on this record, that's the one where it's their oh, that's group. Peter on that, huh? Yeah, and yeah. it's that's two, a great bass line. two <laughs> minutes. <laughs> yeah, you think about two minutes and how great that song is for those two minutes. I think that's my favorite on the whole. Yeah, whole that's thing. a great song. I always love that. The funny thing to me about this record is now they're lobbying for uh, creative emancipation for a couple of years. So they get it. And their big statement is to basically make their version of what they've been putting out already. That's my. That's all they take wanted to it. do. I mean, yeah. that's that's how ironic it was that Kirshner, you know, Kirshner could have struck a balance with them, but he wouldn't, and that's why it's so stupid. And they weren't even lobbying for that long. It was literally like a six month period that we're talking about here. Right. So, and immediately once they've done that, they don't really want to do it anymore. Once they've accomplished doing an album, right? They, they sort of. Right. Th- we'll get to the next one when we get to it, but they t- yeah. they tweak it just a little bit because they they're still the, yeah, they're they still t- involved a lot playing. But yeah. they do they make a couple of tweaks. you know they they keep tweaking that yeah. until it comes full circle. But we'll we're getting ahead of ourselves. But, but so another one I love on this record is "Forget That Girl." That's always been you one of love my that song. I love that song. Actually, it's yeah. like the uh, the clientele or something to me. I, yeah, I, the I, breathy, I dig that song the breathy. Uh, I love uh, you told me, and I'll spend my life with you. Are I mean. The way those two come out of the gate uh, is probably my favorite part of the record. Is just right at the beginning. Um, Chip Douglas had never produced an album before. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a great record, and he pulls together performances from those guys and figures out. You know, he's the best producer they ever had. I agree. Yeah, yeah. And and so that's what's remarkable. It, it's kind of he matches their naivete with his own inexperience. He, 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 gets, and he gets them. It's just brilliant. Yeah, it's yeah. just brilliant. He really gets them. I think a lot. You're going to kill me, but um, you may actually like, literally jump across and throttle me, but I don't think it's as good as the first two records, but I like it more, if that makes any may, makes any sense. I think it's more inconsistent, but the consistency is much is definitely made made up for by charm because yeah, I mean, maybe I'm too personally attached. I you know, for me, the their fight, the four of them and what mm-hmm. they did was so so admirable and and bore such amazing fruit i don't think that we'd be here talking about these guys for hours on end yeah if it wasn't for this yeah, yeah. and i yeah. agree with you yeah. completely this is also the textbook ground zero primer for any concern that comes into its into its own uh, artistically um also i gotta mention for pete's sake so good yeah that's the one that was over the end credits of the show um and i always have loved that too I gave this one four and a half stars, so this was right below the top notch for me, yeah. and I really enjoyed it a lot. I, I, this one I was already pretty familiar with. I pretty I knew this one yeah, pretty I, much every song on this. Already. I give this one four. Yeah, so I'm 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 five stars on this one, all the way. I think it's solid. There's not a song that I would take off. It's a it's a so. great record. So then, uh, so then October '67, uh, going down. Uh, I want to mention that I know it's Daydream Believers B side. That's a great Dolan's performance. Yeah, it's an amazing performance, and it credited to all four monkeys, the, the writing of that with Diane Hildebrand, who had written for the monkeys Early Morning Blues and Greens, mm-hmm. and your Andy Griselda as a co writer with Jack Keller, and had struck up a friendship with uh, Peter Tork, and they were started writing together. And then th- the band jammed this version of Parchment Farm, which, depending on who you asked, it was their arrangement. But Peter, I think it was his arrangement. They did a track, and then 
Michael Nesmith said, we're not covering an old blues thing. It's in the public domain, basically. Why don't we just write some new lyrics? Which is kind of what they did with No Time, which was on headquarters. Plus, if they if they thought they were having problems with authenticity before covering a blues song, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, and he probably also knew that 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 uh, Mickey doing a straight ahead version of Parts from Farm was going to fall flat. I mean, it wasn't going to be what people, you know. It wasn't going to be the Butterfield Blues Band or mm-hmm. or his uh, vocal on this is pretty brother. cool, pretty amazing. But yeah. it's but Mickey when he's in his super inventive, you know, spirit that he has, just can't be touched. And this is uh, yeah, he's so, awesome on this. It's, it's awesome. brilliant. It's so the the monkeys as a creative entity are, you know, they're they're they keep blooming. Uh, this is also the first uh, th- thing I saw that where the Eddie Ho was credited. Oh man, I love him. Although he plays on the. Pleasant Valley Sunday and Word Single, right, right. So, so around the same time, I guess when they're starting to work with him, yeah. Um, so he was he was he in, becomes kind of a de facto uh, monkey for a minute. So then, moving uh, skipping ahead here, about a month, uh, November nineteen sixty seven, ah! Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, and Jones Limited, uh, a stone cold masterwork uh, in an almost objective way. I can say that um, sold more than three three million copies. Um, this was the fourth album there is to reach number one and the last one and the last one and the yeah. last one um, now so they're sneaking in some help now I mean not, no- not even seeking I mean they're credited on the on the back of the record okay. like they like they wanted but they're they are ably assisted because the monkey's career was really taking off they were mostly on tour for a mm-hmm. big chunk of the time they're making this record um, across the country. Plus, they're doing television episodes. Right, right. I mean, these guys, their workload was just insane. If you really look at what they were doing day and night. Yeah, if you night. look at just what's just the records themselves. Even Forget about the fact they're making a TV show and touring and all, you know, just that making so many records and how did, much stuff did didn't they, even did make they, it onto the records. Did they talk with you at all about um, what percentage of it was, you know, I think we're going to need some help on these types of tunes versus being busy? No, you know, I think that it came down to there was a guy named Lester Sill who sort of took over from Don Kirshner. And the monkeys were really his. He he picked the songs on headquarters. He sequenced it, and he did the same with Pisces Aquarius and the subsequent records that he worked on. Um, so he probably went to Chip and said, "Look, we can't get the guys down to the studio. So you're gonna have to start just building up tracks." Chip was already playing bass, so they figured, well, you know, Cuddly Toy thing is the last thing that has Mickey on drums. And maybe Dorn to Summer has double drums with Eddie Ho. But just to get tracks done, um, occasionally the guys would say, well, we want to play at it. And, and he, Michael's playing guitar and a lot of stuff. Peter's, again, multi-instrumentalist, playing a lot of great keyboards it's a and lot of the, It's a lot of the core uh, headquarters band, but with Eddie Ho on drums. And he is killer. And, he's one and of, Chip he's on kinda, bass. Yeah, and Chip on bass. Uh, Eddie Ho is kind of has a little bit more flair than the typical like session that, that I reckon crew guy. He plays, he's playing like... Pretty aggressively on these records. Pretty yeah, great. He High makes energy. amazing, ama- does some amazing stuff, and there's some great little mistakes he makes too that are in there on the tracks. Mm-hmm. But there, it's it's a great record from top to bottom. I think the only track, which is actually the one that's the furthest afield from the rest of the record, which is hard to believe, which is basically Davey with one person, Kim Kapli, who built up the track all on his own without anybody else. So Davey's the only monkey on. Hard to believe. Right, that's kind of the slightest song probably on the record. Still yeah. not bad though. Not bad, but that's I love his vocal. That's, that's yeah, the, and that's moving on to where they would they would go to with their things. Yeah. So uh, post chip, but but it's, there, the, I gotta say, there's nothing I don't like on this record, it, this and, is, uh, and nobody talks about this. Well, one. yeah, this is kind of I think oh, this is kind of probably consensus regarded as their best record. Yeah. Still, I don't think it gets its due for how good it is right. just as a record, period. It's, it's not the, just a good Monkeys record. It's a truly outstanding it's an, a classic great album. Record. It's yeah. forward thinking. You got the you know early use of Moog. Um, you have uh, Paul Beaver on Star Collector, which is right. crazy. I mean, Do you know the story about how they got their Moogs? It was Mickey's Moog, right? Yeah. Right. Well, they those went to weren't, the... Those weren't commonly owned. That's the, why it's like the first Moog on a rock yeah, record. Yeah, he had the third one ever produced. And what happened was they went to the Monterey Pop Festival in the summer of 67. Right. I heard a podcast about this. About and that whole, there, was a bo- there was a booth. There was a booth and, right. and Mickey had the money and said, oh, great, I'll order one. And it uh, was delivered. And then he plays it on Daily Nightly. And mm-hmm. Paul Beaver plays on Star Collector. Right, These are the so. mugs that look like giant switchboards, like a telephone. Yeah, it's a three-panel. Most modular of them had them at like universities mo- is where they kind of mostly were at. That's before you know this is this was the first sort of commercially made for like 
not academic purposes. I, I know it sounds apocryphal, but even tuning a modular MOOC was difficult at that point, getting it in pitch. I mean, you have these different waveforms. You can, you know, make any kind of sound you want, but it, it was a real beast as far as yeah. getting getting work out of it. And I have to say, I like Mickey's work on the Moog better than Paul Beaver's. A lot of people say that. Yeah. A lot of people I mean, say they're that. different styles. They're very, very different, different styles, styles. Yeah. yeah. And and Peter was one who would agree with you. And I, But it's nice that there's a flavor of, of all yeah. of that. I mean, so, let, so let first let's look at the co- great cover, great album. And this cover. is um, the fourth and final design by Bernard Yazin, who did the first four albums, and he painted this one. He told me that the monkeys were so successful at this point. He said I could put them on the cover without their faces, and you would still know it was a monkeys record. And we didn't even have to put the logo, the guitar, famous guitar logo. It could just be slipping down through the clover, and you'd still know. They were so popular that this was the monkey's new album. It helps that they had the hat. The hat, the hat helps. Yeah, but <laughs> this was as close to the white album as they could get yeah, prior yeah. to the white album. They were, yeah. you know, they were they're ready to step back and go into anonymity um, yeah. at this point. So, let, so let's, if we can, train the microscope down on this one a little bit because it really is worthy of that. So we're we're starting with uh, we're starting with Salesman, um, written by Craig Smith, right. who. Is, uh, has, he know, he was in a band it. called the Penny Arcade that, right, that Michael right. was was uh, producing and sort of funding. It sounds like kind of like a Beatley, like she's a woman kind of yeah, vibe, yeah, but then yeah. a little bit more like country sort of twang to it's it. Supposed too. to right. be like a she's about a mover. Thing. Right, that, uh, that's, uh, that's yeah. what it's supposed right, to be. Right. Yeah. yeah, great song um, and sort of un- unassuming, but um, you know, a, definitely a killer opener. Um, then uh, she hangs out uh, a Davy song. Awesome Spectre throwback. I mean, this is just a great and much better thing. than the than the Barry produced version. I think of, yeah, yeah. of a few months earlier, they they kind of up the ante, and it's great. It's such a simple kind of thing, the song, but it just has such a good feel to it. And I love his singing. Uh, you can just sort of picture him doing the little Davy dance. That mm-hmm. <laughs> well, he knows yeah. the song. It makes me want to do the dance. Yeah. <laughs> he knows the song well and knows it better than he did when he recorded it earlier in, in the year. You can yeah. feel his ease where he's yeah. just like. You know, yeah, where it's got he a real is confidence to it. slightly yeah. behind the beat with the singing. You know, he's just yeah. right there in the pocket on yeah, the singing. That's true. He sings great. it great. Love it. See, I love when he sings, gets to sing rockers like that. He's, yeah, he's, yeah. This uh, is a perfect song yeah. for him. And then uh, Door into Summer, that's, that's one of their best songs. One of their very best songs. So good. Um, and uh, and really showcases, you know, what a. What an amazing this song, song I was not, I didn't, I was not really familiar with. So yeah, this, this is a, g- a gem. For it me really to, is like a treat for me to hear. And so it's, like my, by, it's like my new favorite song, written by Bill Martin, who wrote all of your toys. Mm-hmm. So, so then, love is only sleeping, a man wild classic, um, uh, with Nesmith on on lead vocals. By the way, Nesmith on five le- taking five leads on this record, right? And it was difficult to get him into the studio to do those. I know um, because he was married, had. Mm-hmm. A, a child was producing the Penny Arcade. Was you know playing with his motorcycles, doing all kinds of other things. So it's remarkable what Chip got out of the Monkees. But yeah. Chip also kind of knew their strengths vocally. These two records, you hear them the backing vocals on Headquarters and Pisces Aquarius. You hear the four of them interacting in that great way. Right. Yeah, and right. Chip, that was his big strength. He came from a vocal group background. Mm-hmm. The, the the background vocals on this one, especially, really yeah. are wonderful. Here's a question: You may know the answer to, Andrew. Love is Only Sleeping, was that written for the monkeys? That's Man and Whale, right? I don't think it was written specifically for them. The original demo um, is very close to the, to the monkeys version. It's really interesting to me because it's it's kind of like the psych rocker. It's got some like 7-4 time in it. But, mm-hmm. you know, as a songwriting team, they're the songwriting team that wrote, that, that wrote You Lost This Love and Feeling. You know, I know. Wrote, uh, we Gotta Get Out of This on Broadway. Like For them to be able to also write a song like this. Yeah, well, they pretty, pretty, they, they really understand mm-hmm. the idiom. You have like psych, psych. <laughs> they only contributed a few songs to the Monkees, Shades mm-hmm. of Grey, which right. we talked about for headquarters slightly. But this song was particularly interesting, and it's a big favorite of mine and a fan favorite. And until this last year in 2021, never been performed live on stage. And Michael and mm-hmm. Mickey did it on their mm-hmm. final tour together, but they had no clue about how it went anymore or the timing of it. So I had to reteach them how to do it. And in the timing, mean, to me, it's ingrained in my mind how it how it works but basically i sat there with them like every day at soundcheck going over it nope you're coming at the wrong time nope 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 you're, yeah, like, you're, you're like the <laughs> the darian sahanaja of, uh, of well for this for this particular thing yeah i yeah. mean uh, but it was it was interesting we we went but 
the, the only reason why they put up with that was they both loved the song so much and Michael remembered, yeah, when we picked this song, you know, they, they felt that, like they were in on the choice of right. having this on the record. So I know they felt personally attached to it. That's good. That's good. They felt that vindication. Uh, Cuddly toy, I love. Uh, the gotta ha- love that. Harry Nielsen. It's, su- it's such an Harry Nielsen's songwriting voice. You the know? most choosing Davy to sing a song about a gang rape is the most subversive possible. Uh, I mean, that just shows that you know they were really kind of having fun with uh, subverting their image at this. Yeah, point. Yeah, and I don't think that anybody even really took notice of. It. I mean, I didn't. I, I, Star <laughs> Star That's Collector. What it's, about. It's, it's about a Hell's Angels gang mm-hmm. rape. But Star Collector, you know, at the end of the record, I'm sorry to skip ahead, but it, on this subject, the the subject of groupies, the fact mm-hmm. that the monkeys are singing about right. easy sex with groupies, you know, uh, to close off the record is insane. Again, and Davey. Davey. Exactly. Again, Davey, yeah. 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 So another so. reason why this album is so awesome is because they're, they're, they really are subverting that. We close off that side with words. Uh, just a classic boys' heart. Tune. I also remember this one from the TV show distinctly from when I was a kid. Yeah, I, I have to single out that awesome cod psych uh, that shaken beads. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it intro. really evokes, yeah. it really evokes so the cool. beads. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, so then the second second side starts with hard to believe. Um, Kind of a standard Davy showcase. Kind of a Davy is dreamy kind of. But thing, his but the vo- bad, vocals awesome. Um, what am I doing hanging around? It's my other new favorite just song. Just a classic, absolute classic. Um, when I got to that song, I was like, "All right, this record is insane." When I when I got to yeah. that on this, I was like, I, th- "I this is this is this record's unbelievable." Yeah, so good. Pleasant Valley Sunday uh, could be my favorite of their singles uh, about West Orange, New Jersey, which is the town uh, right next door to where I grew up. Uh, grew up in in Livingston uh, written wh- from the you were talking about the perspective of, of writing written by Jerry Goffin while inside a uh, a mental uh, health facility really so, yes demo of it's amazing <laughs> love the Carol King demo huh Wow, she sings, she sings on the demo. It's really amazing. Um, also, the uh, sick drumming, the fast Eddie Ho drumming. That's this is one where he has a couple of flubs. <laughs> Some of the fills kind of hits like a rim here and there, you know. But yeah. um, great high energy drumming, crazy fills, like definitely uh, like more upfront kind of drumming than you'd hear from like a Wrecking Crew. He's, he's he was he was great. Is there what playing. kind of time signature is is there on that one? It's Pleasant Valley starting, Sunday. Yes, yeah, Pleasant Valley Sunday is just in four. Is it really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The riff feels like it's tumbling over into all kinds the of... The intro, in the intro, it's kind of, I think, a little bit out of time. It comes in, like, you, okay. one isn't where you think it is. But the, for the rest of the song, it's all pretty much just straight four. And then uh, Daily Nightly, uh, w- that is the first rock recording uh, to feature Moog that I know of. Right. Uh, and then um, Don't Call On Me with, uh, with Nez, one of my favorites on the record, definitely. Um, and that's a throwback to his folk... Balladeer days, it, which yeah. he had written in '65, and it then it feels like the Buckinghams to me. Like. He kind of revived it, and it was a nice um, sort of thing for John London, who co-wrote it, who was his buddy before the Monkees, and then worked with him afterwards in the first National yeah. Band. Not really in his Monkees songwriting voice, but no, uh, great song. Though. In fact, it's I don't easy, know, like major seven, kind of breezy, kind of. Yeah. I don't know anything that he's written that feels like this. Yeah, good, no, good no. song. Yeah, really, really nice. And then Star Collector. Um, I mean, this is, uh, man, this is just awesome. Uh, again, the great, great drum pattern, the, the way that the, he plays the drums. Some, again, uh, there's a great demo of this, too. Uh, th- I think this is also Jerry Goffin. Th- th- this, that one is, is Jerry sings on the demo. S- super cool. This is a hard five. A very, very hard five. Yeah. Uh, five stars here for Pisces Aquarius. Yeah, I think, uh, and you're, you're It's five, five stars. It's my favorite of the records, yeah, for sure. I mean... It's their finest half hour. For I, sure. can't, I can't say right now because then that would be flipping a card. <clears throat> but suffice it to say that they were at a zenith here aesthetically, but right up around the bend, uh, we had some uh ohs lurking up ahead. Did we not, Joseph? There are some uh ohs coming, but there's also some really good uh, stuff coming. There's a real. It's a pretty interesting period that happens next. Yeah, which we will get to next week on part two. That's right. There's just too much to cover here, so definitely uh, stay tuned next week. 
Uh, for the, in the meantime, the link to the playlist is in the show notes, also in our website, discograffiti.com. As always, you know, we implore you to follow us on the Twitters and the Instagrams and come harass us in the Facebook discussion group and recommend us to a friend and subscribe. Way and more than just one friend, of course. Many of your, all of your many friends. Many of them. All Andrew, of them. Andrew Sandoval has recommended us to all of his friends. You could do exactly the same. Don't forget to rate the podcast five-star ratings only. That's the only thing that we accept especially if you listen to us on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And um, we have a lot more in store with you. We will be back next week with Andrew to discuss the next many phases of the monkeys. That's career. right. We're going to sit here and wait for a week. We have him held we have this. We have the spray cans ready to go. That's right. That's right. There's Mason them there cans. We'll see you next week on Discography. Discography.